start our meeting, our workshop, California Public Utilities Commission will present a brief history and overview of the CPUC. You're on. Is this is the microphone on? It Am is. I talking about the right volume. All right, yeah. great. So first of all, I want to thank um, Aaron and all of you for inviting us to come and give you a brief presentation, an overview of the California Public Utilities Commission. I'm Cindy Nelson. I'm a local government liaison with the CPUC. I'm based in the Sacramento office. And I'm delighted that Roger Clugston was able to join me tonight to share in this presentation. He is the deputy director for our Office of Rail Safety, and he actually lives here in Bakersfield. Uh -huh. um, and he's, I always love working with Roger because he's just a wealth of knowledge and information about the history of railroads and rail safety. He's very passionate about rail safety and uh, just a great public servant. So I'm delighted that he's here. I'm going to give you a very brief overview of the CPUC and my role as a local government liaison, and then I'm going to let Roger dazzle you with a lot more information about some of the rail safety activities and, and programs. So I just started with the CPUC back in December, and I took over from Cody Naylor, who I understand came and gave you a presentation about two years ago. Mm -hmm. And um, fortunately for me, he spent a great deal of time with me sharing information and training me. In fact, shared with me his presentation that he gave you two years ago. Um, so I, I hope that I can be as uh, wonderful a speaker as he was. My role is to be your point of contact with the CPUC. So if you have issues or questions that come up, uh, about some of the companies or industries that you regulate. You don't have to make 20 phone calls to the CPUC to try and find out who to talk to. You can call me. And I left, uh, you know that Tammy left some of the information um, at each of your seats there. Um, my business card, some of our CPUC brochures, and um, there's a lot of information there. And we have a wealth of expertise back at the commission, so if you have questions, issues that come up, I will help connect you with the right person or I'll get answers to your questions. So that's my role. Let's see if I can move this along. Let me find my notes so that I don't give you any misinformation. So in 1911, the CPUC was established by constitutional amendment as the Railroad Commission, and Roger's going to talk more about that in his presentation. In 1912, the legislature passed the Public Utilities Act, and that expanded the commission's regulatory authority to include natural gas, electric, telephone, and water companies, as well as railroads and transportation companies. And then in 1946, the Railroad Commission was renamed the California Public Utilities Commission. Our overarching mission has been to ensure the utility service for California customers that's safe, affordable, sustainable, and reliable, and not only today, but far into the future. And technology changes so quickly that it's very difficult sometimes to keep up with all of that and, and keep the regulatory requirements in place. The CPUC is the state agency that regulates essential services, including rates and services of energy companies like PG&E and Southern California Edison, consumer protection and public programs for telecommunication companies such as AT&T and Frontier, water, rates and services of water and sewer companies like California Water Service Company and Golden Hills Sanitation Company. I believe we regulate about 20% of the water companies in the state. And then safety regarding rail companies such as BNSF and moving companies, limousines, shuttles, and transportation network companies such as Lyft and Uber. We also provide consumer assistance and education related to the industries that we regulate. And one of the brochures that you have uh, is all about our consumer programs. So Lifeline and the CARE program provide basic essential services, uh, basic phone service in the case of Lifeline, 
and energy in the case of the CARE program to low-income residents that qualify based on the eligibility requirements. The Energy Upgrade California offers tips, services, and programs to help you save energy and water. We have a deaf and disabled telephone program, DDTP, that provides special telephones and phone service to, um, for dis deaf and disabled Californians. And then we also, also offer tips and advice on hiring a passenger carrier or a moving company. Uh, limousines are, are in our purview as well as airport shuttles um, and moving companies as well. And then we have staff that give presentations usually in partnership with Senior Scam Stopper on fraud prevention and scam prevention. And I've, I've done a little bit of that myself. I think the last presentation I gave was in Clovis to a group of seniors. And then the CPUC has a team of specialized caseworkers that can work with consumers to resolve disputes that they may have with you, the utility providers that we regulate. We have a whole bunch of people that, um, that operate the phones, answer a lot of phone calls, and our consumer affairs branch processes thousands of complaints each year, and they can play a very constructive role in mediating difficult issues. So with that, that's a very quick overview of the CPUC, and I'm gonna hand the clicker and the micro microphone over to Roger and have him talk with you a little bit about the Office of Rail Safety, and then if there's time at the end, we can answer any questions, or you also have our contact information, so um, you'll be able to do that later on as well. Thank you. Roger. Well, I have more than two buttons on Contraptions, but all you have to do is point uh, direction, can, and the one on the right will advance. I can manage that. Good. <laughs> Hi, I'm Roger Clickson. I'm Deputy Director for the Office of Rail Safety for the California Public Utilities Commission. I have uh, been in the railroad business uh, for a little over 44 years. Uh, I've been with the commission approximately 17 years now. Um, most people don't even know who we are. Uh, it's real, real interesting. We work in association with the Federal Transportation Agency and the Federal Railroad Administration. Uh, we work with a lot of other entities such as FEMSA, um, all, uh, uh, Coast Guard, other entities. We do everything from inspecting grade crossings, railroad bridges, railroad signal systems, rail transit systems. We go down to the ports in Los Angeles and uh, San Pedro and up in Oakland, and whenever ships come in containing hazardous materials that are going to be loaded onto rail cars, we go in. If we find anything wrong, we cut the containers open ourselves with bolt cutters and inspect the contents to make sure that you and none of the citizens in the state of California get uh, uh, afflicted with some sort of hazardous material that's been improperly packaged or shipped by some entity overseas. So our work is pretty varied and I'll tell you a little bit more about it but I wanted to tell you a little bit about really the history of the Public Utilities Commission. We were the Railroad Commission of California. That's how we started out. 1879. We've been around that long. Uh, back in those days the um, Southern Pacific Railroad had uh, quite a stranglehold on the state of California and um, they owned everything. They uh, owned all the railroad lines. They uh, managed uh, all transportation costs, whether it was on navigation, on the rivers, or uh, the ports coming in like into uh, uh, Stockton, inland ports like that. Um, and th they needed to break that. So uh, it took some time, but finally the um, corrupt government that ran the state of California at the time decided that we need to placate the citizens, so we're going to go ahead and assign a commission to handle rates to make sure that they're competitive rates. And we're gonna put three people in that job. Well, they needed railroad people. Unfortunately, they could only find them at Southern Pacific. So uh, this group of three commissioners was dubbed the Southern Pacific Literary Club because they didn't do anything. <laughs> and until 1911, when we got a new state constitution, did things change under Hiram Johnson and a lot of great changes came to California, and Article 12 of our Constitution established us as a, a, a really viable, huge force. We increased our numbers by two people, so we were five at that point in time. And um, from that point onward, we took over control of 
all aspects of um, uh, railroad transportation to state. We've drifted away from rates and went towards more uh, safety-oriented uh, concerns regarding the construction of rail systems in the state of California to ensure that not only the public was safe, but that railroad employees themselves were also safe. Uh, then in 1912, uh, the state of California, under this new constitution, they were trying to figure out what are we going to do with all of these other utilities? We need to regulate them because we can't trust them to do the right things, so uh, we'll just give them to the Railroad Commission because we don't know what else to do with them. So they piled all of the utilities on top of the Railroad Commission, and then it wasn't until 40, 1946 that they changed our name to the Public Utilities Commission. Um, I have three branches within the Office of Rail Safety. We are a much bigger organization now. These three branches, I have approximately 110 employees. Um, out of that, more than half are field inspectors. We have the largest field inspection staff looking at transit and railroad systems in the United States, independent of the federal government. As a matter of fact, my railroad operations and safety branch, which handles all of the carriers such as BNSF and Union Pacific, uh, we actually outnumber the Federal Railroad Administration as, as a for the number of inspectors in the field here in California. Uh, I have a rail transit safety branch. We look at all of the uh, transit systems throughout the state. They're beginning to proliferate again. Uh, they died out uh, basically just prior to World War II, and now they're starting to come back. And then we also look at uh, railroad grade crossings, a rail crossing engineering branch. And we have, <clears throat> on the heavy rail side, we have approximately 8,000 miles of railroad track in California. Uh, but that doesn't include multiple main lines, where you have double and triple main lines. It does not include multiple tracks within yards, and it does not include all industry tracks. But we look at those, too. We look at all of the um, aspects of it, all of the disciplines, whether it's track operating practices, uh, hazardous material shipments, signals, mechanical meaning railroad equipment, locomotives, rail cars, we look at everything. Uh, when it comes to grade crossings, we have uh, approximately 13,500 railroad grade crossings in California. We look at all of them. And we do diagnostic analyses on each and every one of them. And we, ha we have a database that we maintain to make sure that each and every grade crossing um, has the appropriate equipment, and we try to help with uh, some other federal programs we have, uh, the 130 program, which is to do railroad crossing upgrades, and my favorite, which is the 190 program, which is grade separations. In other words, eliminating the grade crossing and doing an overpass or an underpass. Our goal is to get rid of every grade crossing in California, make sure they can go over or under it uh, to keep uh, people from getting injured and hurt, uh, I don't think we're going to get there anytime soon, but we certainly are making an effort towards that direction. Um, uh, the group of people that I have, I've got um, uh, varied uh, talents. I have people working for me. A gentleman, one of, one of my favorite people, just retired in August, and uh, his railroad experience goes back. He started to, uh, working, uh, to work on the railroad in 1961 and I had him still working. I've got a lot of guys that were working in the 60s that are still working for me. Uh, some former bosses of mine work for me now. I've got uh, myself, I started in the early 70s at 18. I worked, uh, my profession is track, uh, track engineering construction. Um, so we have people with varied talents. We have uh, professional engineers, we have analysts, we have uh, just a wide array of people with varied backgrounds. Uh, a lot of the uh, initiatives that we uh, have in place are things that have not happened. And even though we've been around since 1879, um, as I started to get promotions within the uh, Public Utilities Commission, I realized that there was a number of things that we were not doing, that nobody was doing. Uh, the biggest concern I had was railroad bridges. Really, nobody is effectively looking at railroad bridges. And you may not realize it, but we have steel structures in the state of California that date back to the late 1860s. So my father worked for the railroad. He was in bridge and building. His job was to uh, paint uh, and maintain railroad bridges, structures, and things of that nature. So growing up with him and living out on the railroad as a kid, 
I saw a lot of these things firsthand, and they were a great concern to me. Whenever we used to run refrigerator cars back in the old days where you actually put ice and, and, and salt in, on the end of the bulkheads, when that would drain out, it would lay on top of the steel structures. So it was important to go and sandblast the bridge, repaint it, and then put grease on all of the horizontal surfaces to repel this saltwater brine. So I, I knew we needed to do this, so I started an initiative, and now we have the only railroad bridge inspection program by a state entity that participates with the Federal Railroad Administration. I have two bridge inspectors now. The Federal Railroad Administration has five to cover 85,000 plus bridges in the United States. We have approximately 6,500 railroad bridges in California. These were numbers that before I started this nobody knew, believe it or not. Um, so a number of initiatives like that this year my work plan we're looking at railroad tunnels people don't think about that much but we've got approximately 300 to maybe 325 railroad tunnels in the state of california so nobody's looking at the integrity of of the structure itself we're analyzing each and every one and trying to document what is under the surfacing within the lining of the tunnel is it is a timber structure is it rock uh, is it degrading? What did it look like, you know, uh, as a, uh, years back? What, what information can we find on any accidents, incidents that may have happened inside of those tunnels to try to figure out and mitigate potential risks as we see them going forward? So we have a number of initiatives, and uh, Cindy and I have been working on one that I have regarding uh, a uh, gray crossing pavement painting project where we're actually painting the dynamic envelope of a railroad grade crossing. We want to, I want to paint it bright red outlined with white lines and this dynamic envelope encompasses the track and goes out six feet on each side so that drivers when they pull up to it in their vehicle and maybe there's a queue, there's an intersection that is supposed to be preempted when the warning gates come down, they can see that I shouldn't stop on this red area. This is a dangerous area. So we're working with the city of Merced and we're hoping that uh, they, they are very positive in working with us to try this out probably on M Street up there and see what kind of um, change it will make in poor driver behavior. Um, you folks, I live in Bakersfield and, and I, I believe all of you do too. And we know that in Bakersfield that drivers stop at every stop sign. Nobody ever runs a red light. Uh, so that kind of bad driver behavior is what we're trying to identify at grade crossings to keep them from smacking into the side of the crude oil unit trains that I've been monitoring coming into our town for the past four or five years. Uh, we watch them very closely. We're, we're, we're looking at every potential risk that we can. We are looking beyond our regulations. If I don't have a regulation and I see a perceived risk, uh, a very obvious identifiable risk or even one that is a subtle hint of a potential risk. We, we take enforcement actions in various ways to compel that entity, whether it's a railroad or rail transit system or a shipper of hazardous materials or a, a grain facility or, you know, somebody like uh, uh, Plains All-American Petroleum out here, TAP, to make sure that they are following a safe course to ensure that these trains can get into the state of California through the five access lines to Bakersfield, make the 30 mile trip out to Taft without derailing and blowing up. That's my goal is to make sure that doesn't happen. So I have a bunch of dedicated people that work very hard to follow us. And now you don't hear about us and that's good uh, because that means our, we're doing our job very well. When you do hear about us, it's usually because there's been a derailment or some tragedy such as Chatsworth or the one down in Oxnard a couple of years ago or the horrible time that we had till we finally pretty much fixed Kratzmeyer Road out here near Shafter. That was the uh, worst grade crossing in California. Anyways, my point is, is that lots of dedicated people out there each and every day trying to make sure we can do what we can. I know I'm long-winded. I apologize. Um, uh, rail crossing engineering branch, uh, we're making sure that uh, we're trying to get upgrades that we can 
um, uh, work with uh, various uh, entities, uh, counties, uh, municipalities, and through various grant programs to get upgrades to it to where we have the most effective and the most up-to-date crossing warning devices. That's not always possible. We still have in Fresno County and in, uh, over in Kings County, we still have some uh, wigwag type uh, crossing warning devices that were installed in 1920. But, you know, they're still working, but we're still hopeful that we can upgrade those in time. But 13,500 crossings is a lot to look at. And I have an engineer assigned uh, to each, uh, that, uh, each county, a group of um, uh, counties is assigned to each individual engineer. And then we supplement that with our inspection staff from the heavy rail side. Um, I, I'm okay. I, I I apologize for going so long. I can usually talk for several days. Uh, the bottom line, I I guess, uh, in uh, as as uh, the great orator uh, in the 19th century said, uh, the last thing I want to say is that I appreciate you giving me just a few minutes to talk to you, and I would be glad to answer any questions. Um, my information is available online. I'm easy to get a hold of. If I can ever be of assistance. I'd be more than glad to. So I apologize for taking so much time, but thank you very much. Thank you. Does the board have any questions? Seeing none, thank you very much. Let's call this uh, current Council of Governments, Transportation, Planning, Policy Committee to order, please. Please stand for the flag salute. Salute, pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Roll call. Ortiz. Present. Gonzalez. Gonzalez. Here. Wood. Here. Pasquale. Here. Mock. Cantu. Mauer. Here. Prout. Yes. Cryer. Yes. Smith. Here. Wegman. Yes. Couch. Scribner. Miller. Here. Kiernan. Thank you. Item three, public comments. This portion of the meeting is reserved for persons to address the committee on any matter not on this agenda, but under the jurisdiction of the committee. Committee members may respond briefly to statements made or questions posed. They may ask a question for clarification, make a referral to staff for factual information or request staff to report back to the committee at a later meeting. Speakers are limited to two minutes with the authority of the chair to extend the time limit as deemed appropriate for the conducting of the meeting. Please state your name and address for the record prior to making a presentation. Do we have any public comments? Good evening, Dixie Walters, Kern County Sheriff's Office here with my monthly update on our work crews. So we are moving into our second quarter of the fiscal year 1718. Uh, since July of this year, we've had 53 different work sites using about 2,500 man hours of labor between detention deputies and inmates. Um, we have had a couple of requests, one just now, um, for the Taft area um, around Derby Acres. And we have had a request for um, the Wasco area, 46 and 43, from Mr. Paris. But most recently, we've hit McFarland, Delano, Bakersfield, and uh, those are our main areas we've hit recently. But we'll we'll hit those target areas. We take requests all the time, so um, that's about it. We are doing pretty good. And uh, any questions? Nope. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any more public comments? Seeing none. We'll move on. Consent agenda. All items on the consent agenda are considered to be routine and non-controversial by Kern Cog staff and will be approved by one motion 
if no member of the committee or public wishes to comment or ask questions. If comment or discussion is desired by anyone, the item will be removed from the consent agenda and will be considered in the listed sequence with any opportunity for any member of the public to address the committee concerning the item before the action is taken. We have items A through H. Motion to approve. S second. Roll call vote. Garola? Yes. Gonzalez? Aye. Wood? Yes. Pasquale? Yes. Mauer? Aye. Prout? Yes. Fryer? Yes. Smith? Yes. Wegman? Yes. Miller? Yes. Para? Yes. Kiernan? Thank you. Item number five, 2018 Regional Transportation Transportation Improvement Program. Mr. Stramoglia. Madam Chair and Directors, this draft capital improvement program proposes to use up to $79.5 million of new regional 2018 STIP funding. The proposed Kern Cog 2018 RTIP capital improvement program advances three Kern projects, including one State Route 58 Centennial Corridor, two State Route 46 widening of uh, Phase 4 Segment B, and State Route 14 Freeman Gulch widening for the second phase of that project. Construction is proposed for Centennial, design and right-of-way are proposed for State Route 46 Segment B, and design only is proposed for the Freeman Gulch uh, Phase 2 project. The draft capital improvement program also proposes three partnership projects, one in Stanislaw in exchange for state revenue on State Route uh, 46, uh, again, Phase 4, Segment 4A, and two MOU projects, including, again, the State Route 14 Freeman Gulch project um, and the U.S. 395 Olancha Cartago project in Enyo County which is one of the MOU projects that was deprogrammed in the 2016 RTIP cycle and now is proposed for restoration in this cycle. The proposed Kern Cog 2018 RTIP CIP also includes $160 million in total programming for the three Kern projects just mentioned, in addition to $141 <coughs> million of total programming or total value for the two projects outside the county for a total value of 301 plus million, which includes uh, the local federal demonstration and the STIP formula funding. I said 301 plus because I don't have the actual total value listed for the Stanislaus uh, project. I know it's on uh, State Route 99 and it's an interchange project, so that was a fixed amount that we agreed to, to trade uh, with our TCRP funding. Uh, so, having said that, those are significant um, investments and we're excited that we're able to advance them. The draft 2018 Interregional Transportation Improvement Program, or ITIP, was just made public on October 12th and represents 25% of the state's participation in the STIP process. These are the dollars that we leverage in our MOU projects along the Eastern California Corridor, which include contributions from Inyo and Mono counties. The draft ITIP, as it's called, proposal includes the advancement of two projects uh, uh, that were just mentioned, including 68 million of ITIP proposed for, again, the US 395 Alancha Cartago widening project in Inyo County, along with the proposed Kern Cog participation at 10% or $11 million. The Kern Cog CIP and draft ITIP proposes also then to advance the design phase only for Freeman Gulch uh, uh, widening segment two. State Route 46 segment B is not proposed for construction in this cycle. Instead, remaining federal earmark funds will be used to deliver the design and rights away phase. The draft ITIP we are very pleased to report includes 
a supportive comment from Caltrans uh, indicating their commitment to deliver the construction phase of 4B in a future ITIP cycle. Uh, and so we anticipate a cooperative programming effort, hopefully in the next RTIP cycle, to to complete that uh, next phase and that last phase. So at this point in time, the anticipated revision uh, that we might be um, expecting for November, because my report to you today is still information, but it is our draft CIP. But the only revision we expect or anticipate might be with regards to um, the advanced pro project development element, which is a simple way of saying uh, in the STIP guidelines anyway, if you want to borrow from the future cycle, we'll let you if you want to start new project or new work on environmental and design. We did list three projects in the CIP. Uh, we're not sure that they need to still be there. Uh, in November because we need to deliver 46B and we do want to advance uh, for, uh, the projects on segment 14, or State Route 14, excuse me. And so we will be talking to our technical advisory committee folks at the next workshop coming up, which is on October 25th, and talk about that a little more. We're also in consultation with Caltrans uh, District 6 and District 9 to get an idea of the feasibility. Is it worth trying to deliver the, the truck climbing lane project for environmental and design and or a 99 augmentation uh, lane project or auxiliary lane project as well as a seventh standard road? They're all gr good projects, there's no question, but it may or may not be the right thing to do at this time because $9 million is, could go a long way uh, to advance the other projects that we've already started on. So other than that last bit of consideration, um, I would say the, the CIP is where uh, we believe it should be at this time. Uh, a, as a final note, uh, staff would expect that the, um, the focus in this cycle is on Metro Bakersfield, on Centennial. Uh, we feel strongly about that. It's ready to go out the door, but we, we propose that the 60-40 um, equity balance could be brought back a little more in the next cycle as we've done in the past where non-metro went a little higher but in order to deliver 46 and 14 in a future cycle we think at that point you know we'll bring it back and so again with that uh, that concludes my report at this time and be happy to answer any questions you might have thank you thank you any questions for Mr. Stramoglia from the board? From the public? Thank you. Thank you so much. Caltrans report. Good evening. I'm going to start with the Shafter Wasco ADA ramp project on State Route 43 in Shafter and Wasco. Currently, the contractor is waiting on the arrival of some custom drainage plates. These plates were a request by the city of Shafter. So once those arrive, um, we can continue working. We also have the Kern Avenue pedestrian overcrossing. This is to do ADA uh, upgrades. This is on 99 at the Kern Avenue pedestrian um, uh, crossing. The deck pour should be completed this week, which this is Thursday. They should be done by tomorrow. Project is on schedule for completion in March of 2018, so next year. We have the Delano Roundabout. Uh, intersection was open to traffic on Wednesday. Project should be completed by the end of this month, or plant, project should be completed by the end of the, October except for what they call plant establishment. The Formosa 46 and 99 bridge, that's a bridge replacement. Contractor started site pre preparation on October 2nd. The Kern County Seismic Restoration, that's at 99 in Airport Drive, the overcrossing, and then 99 in Golden State Avenue, that separation. Project is complete, and now they are in plant establishment for the next year. 
but really it's complete when they talk about plant establishments. That's the um, vegetation and things like that, that the contractor has to maintain that for the next year, make sure all the vegetation survives. Uh, Taft Highway uh, rehabilitation on 99, um, north of Herring Road over crossing to Pacheco Road under crossing. Project was awarded to security paving on October 2nd. I don't have a construction start date yet. State Route 46, um, that is um, the segment 4A. Bid opening is scheduled for November 1st. So I'll look forward to reporting on that. I'm just hoping they don't start and then go into winter suspension because sometimes that happens and that, to me that's disappointing. Um, but I understand the weather conditions. So I'll look forward to reporting on that. That's a big project. And that's all I have. Great, thank you. Executive Director's Report. Good evening, Madam Chair and Board Members. I have uh, a few minutes of comments, but I will try to make it brief. Uh, over the past uh, several weeks, um, staff has been visiting your cities. Uh, September 20th, they were in Ridgecrest. September 26th, Cal City. October 2nd, they were in Tehachapi. October 10th, in Maricopa. October 11th, Bakersfield. October 12th, in McFarland. And just this week, Wasco and Shafter on the same night. October 17th. Over the next several weeks, they'll be in Delano on November 6th. Arvin, November 7th. The Board of Supervisors, November 14th, and finally Taft on November 21st. Uh, Rob Ball and Becky Napier are making those presentations on the 2018 um, RTP and SCS, and they've been doing a great job from what I've heard. October 12th, Joe mentioned in his presentation, uh, Caltrans released their recommendations for the ITIP. There was some incredibly good news. Joe just touched on it, but uh, almost all of us are familiar with the James Dean uh, inter intersection at the intersection of 41 and 46, and the the grade that comes up towards Kern County, um, that trucks usually have to slow down to about 25 or 30 miles an hour to get up that grade. Both those projects were recommended for funding uh, to the tune of well over $100 million. So. Mm -hmm. Great, great news. Even though the project is uh, in San Luis Obispo County, the majority of the people that use that stretch of highway, uh, including many of you, some of you have told me you've gotten caught in uh, delays and have seen pretty horrific accidents in that those areas, including um, law enforcement officer for, from Kern County was recently killed there. Um, projects uh, are recommended for funding. Majority of the people that use that route are from Kern County and from Valley Counties. So great news there. On October 17th, uh, we conducted an ITS stakeholder meeting in this room. Many of your uh, cities and county staff attended. We had close to 40 people in the room. Very, very well attended. Uh, excellent meeting. Uh, yesterday, uh, up to um, Late this morning, I attended a, a CTC meeting in Modesto. That was also a very productive meeting. I will just give you some quick highlights. Um, several Congratulations to several of our cities and the county. Kern County was able to advance uh, a project in Boron to increase uh, ped pedestrian facilities, Rexland Acres here in the Bakersfield metro area, but it's an unincorporated area was advanced. Uh, as well as a project on Virginia Street. Arvin uh, was able to advance the Franklin Pedestrian and Bicycle Improvement Project. Congratulations to all of you. Those projects are all being advanced as a result of SB1 passing. All those projects uh, that are being advanced and the projects that I mentioned previously um, uh, at the James Dean intersection on 46, none of those projects would have happened, nor would they have been advanced without the, the funds generated by SB1. Um, the CTC also took action on segment four, uh, four around Lost Hills. That was good news. They also added over $150 million in shop projects 
on routes 46, 119, 184, 204, and Interstate 5, all in, in Kern County. They awarded $299,000 to help fund the work that Kern Cog does. Um, ver very productive meeting, well over $150 million awarded, and almost all of that was a result of SB1. Just a, a few more items I have for you tonight. Um, October 19th to was uh, today, High Speed Rail met. We had staff there at the, as well as Bakersfield had uh, staff there. October 25th, there will be a press conference in Bakersfield at the Caltrans Maintenance Yard, $1,200 drive. I believe uh, at least two or maybe more of you are scheduled to be there. Some of you are scheduled to s speak. It's open to the public. public be a press conference about SB1. That's 10 a.m. October 25th at the Caltrans Maintenance Yard on Olive Drive. October 26th is a business conference. There's also information in your folder. Kern Cog will have a booth there uh, in conjunction with the Valley Air District to promote electric vehicle incentives. October 29th, the San Joaquin Joint Powers Authority Rail Committee meeting will be held in Stockton. Uh, and in addition to the RTP workshops that we've been having in your council, we will have Kern Cog staff visiting all of your cities and the county over the next few months to go over the active transportation plan that we've been working on. Uh, it will likely be Pete Smith uh, and may maybe one or two others visiting your staffs and telling you what our consultant <coughs> has come up with in conjunction with your staffs for active transportation projects. reason why I mention that specifically, in future rounds of ATP, and we've as collectively been very successful, we'll now be able to state that the county has an ATP plan for the entire county, and you'll be able to receive five more points. So we have the potential to be even more successful than we have. And the last item I have, Madam Chair, is the at the next KernCog meeting, um, High Speed Rail is scheduled to give the workshop, and what she's likely to be reporting on will be the release of the draft environmental document for the locally generated alternative, which will change the alignment between Shafter and Bakersfield. So uh, we, we may have a packed house for that, just a heads up. Uh, subject to any of your questions, uh, Madam Chair or board members, that concludes my report on this agenda. Any questions for the director? Seeing none, thank you, Aaron. Moving into the current Council of Governments agenda, roll call is different. No? We have Cantu now and Gorolo. Okay. Public comments. This portion of the meeting is reserved for persons to address the council on any matter not on this agenda, but under the jurisdiction of the council. Do we have any public comments? Seeing none. Consent agenda. All items on the consent agenda, which there is none. Is there? There is? Two. Oh, okay. Okay. Do I have a motion for the consent calendar? So, so move. Second. All in favor say aye. Um, aye. There's a roll call vote. Garola? <laughs> yes. Jump the gun on that one. Gonzalez? Aye. Wood? Yes. Pasquale? Yes. Cantu? Aye. Mauer? Yes. Prout? Yes. Pryor? Yes. Smith? Yes. Wegman? Yes. Thank you. Moving all the way down to the executive director's report. Good evening again, Madam Chair. Um, the item that you just approved on the consent agenda is information about the regional awards ceremony. Believe it or not, it's time to think about um, nominations. So as a reminder, the categories are listed there. The deadline uh, is also listed there. It's December 1st. And I'd like to ask if anyone would like to volunteer to be on the committee to evaluate those proposals. We will meet on Thursdays, December 
first, probably around 5, we'll set the exact time, and we will have dinner. Um, Madam Chair, can I get some volunteers, maybe? Anybody want to volunteer? I'll volunteer. Kathy? I'll volunteer. Speak up. Cindy? Jennifer? Jennifer? Phil? I'll try to make it more true. And Orschel. Anybody else? That that's more than enough. Thank that's you. That's good. You mm -hmm. very good. much, Madam Chair. That's December twenty first. That's December twenty first. We'll send out the exact time uh, that's convenient. It'll probably be a, a dinner meeting. Okay. Okay. Just two more quick items. On October 29th to thirty first, I'll be attending the Focus on the Future conference in uh, San Francisco. That's uh, about transportation. October 30th is the KCAC meeting. It will be held in Tehachapi, not Maricopa. I had Maricopa on my calendar. That's October 30th, KCAC in Tehachapi. In your folders this evening is the schedule of cast disbursements, outreach efforts, the timeline, some information on uh, funding plan for clean transportation in, in incentives, draft project allocations. Oh, this this uh, got my attention. This, so a, also a letter from Lorelei Oviat from Kern County announcing the availability of community development block grant funds, CDBG. An announcement of the transit symposium being postponed and uh, I referenced this before, I, a copy of an email about the Bakersfield Business Conference Expo where we will have a booth along with a free admission coupon and there's more of those coupons on the desk if you would like any. That's all I have on this agenda, Madam Chair, subject to any of your questions. Any questions for the director? I have one really quick. You said the 21st for the the 21st is a regular Kern Cog meeting? Yeah, we, we will uh, be dark for the full Kern Cog board meeting okay. in December, but since you, I'm sure all of you have that date reserved, we will use that date instead to evaluate the uh, regional awards. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you, Aaron. Do we have any member statements? Just if I may, or through the chair, um, I want to personally thank uh, Kern Cog staff and uh, Caltrans. Um, she mentioned Kern Avenue. She wasn't specific. It was McFarland. And I uh, want to say that we're very happy. There's a lot of energy in McFarland, a lot of excitement with that new overpass. Um, one of the things I think it's very unique is that ours is going to have silhouettes of runners running across. So as you're driving <laughs> through the freeway, you'll know you're McFarland and, uh, or you're going through McFarland. So I want to thank you all uh, for doing that. Uh, also want to thank Rob for being there at, our, at the last meeting. Uh, one of the things that we were concerned about was that uh, we we're interested in seeing that McFarland, um, and I don't know if this is something to brag about or be worried about because it showed that the, our roads in our city had very little, uh, we, we, have, we don't have much need. <laughs> but if you ask my residents, they tell mm -hmm. you otherwise. I'm sure you guys all have the same yeah. issues at home, right? And so, uh, so anyways, I want to personally thank all of you guys for that and also for uh, Kern Cog staff for giving us a beautiful framed picture. It was a picture of an old um, uh, pharmacy um, that existed many, many years ago in the 30s there at McFarland. And um, uh, we now have, it's amazing how, how things work. Um, w many years ago, that was an original drugstore. And now we have Rite Aid there at the same location. <laughs> so I think that <laughs> portrait goes up, should be up at that Rite, uh, Rite Aid store. So I want to thank all you guys. We're very happy to be a par part of Kern Cog. Thank you. Any other member statements? If I could add on to that, your your pedestrian overcrossing is already a attracting attention from all over the state, asking how can we put uh, we we can put things on our overcrossings. So, great job, uh, Mayor. Uh, thank you. Thank you. And through the chair, I'd like to say we all we all appreciate everything that our staff does. They keep us surprised. They keep us updated. They come and visit us way on the other east side, and we really do appreciate that. Thank you. Yes, we do. Thank you very much. Okay, we have uh, an award tonight. Before we quit for Robert Ball. Is your 
your gift for 25 years of dedicated wow. service to the current Council of Governments. Thank you. Thank you. It's yours. Take it. Yes. <laughs> All right. This meeting's adjourned. Thank Just you very much.